I, I Deborah, I know you have some opening remarks to deliver, and, and so I think I, it. It's time. It's time, okay. I think. And they're short they're, because we've got a lot of exciting stuff happening. What I mostly was going to say is welcome back, everybody. This is our final segment, which is very exciting. We're going to do two programs, both with groups of people who are working very hard to save their own traditions in very different ways. They're going to seem very different as you listen to them, but in fact, their eventual goal is the same thing. And then after that, we've had a number of people say that they didn't want it just to end so abruptly and disappear. So there will be breakout rooms or a conversation group at the end for anybody who's not ready to just turn it off. Um, we're glad you're here. We're glad you've been here for the weekend. It's pretty exhausting. We're excited next year we're going to have a meeting that's half live and half virtual based. The live part's going to be in Ohio and the virtual part's going to be everywhere you are. We haven't figured out how that works yet, but we're working on it. So thanks for coming and Kelsey, it's yours. Okay. Thank you, Deborah. Um, mm -hmm. So it is my pleasure to introduce the first panel of our two panels today. And before I do that, I just want to thank everyone, like Deborah thanked everyone. Um, right, it's awesome. just been a great pleasure to have you all here this weekend, or if you're joining us um, for the first time this weekend, then welcome to you. Um, this is our 2022 virtual annual meeting, and we have been exploring the theme of tradition, innovation, and community stewardship, the evolution of textile arts this whole weekend. So welcome to all of you, um, and thank you for being here. So our, our first panel discussion today is Reviving Traditional Textiles of India. All around the world, textile traditions and the cloth and techniques they have created and practiced for millennia are in danger of being lost. It is not just a matter of losing a design option. These textiles are an important part of the culture, carrying history, memory, and meaning. India is the seventh largest country in the world with one of the oldest and, my, and most diverse textile histories on the planet. The speakers on this panel are all revivalists working to revive historic Indian textile culture in distinct areas while artisans who remember can still share the information. So we welcome our three presenters and I'm going to introduce panel moderator, Sheila Desai, who organized this panel and knows each of the, the presenters quite well. So Sheila is founder and owner of Canadian-based EYHO Tours, which specializes in textile travels to the world's traditional societies. Throughout her tours, Sheila connects creators from traditional societies to appreciators from the industrialized world. Textile sales in Canada, support of local nonprofits, and visits and workshops with local artisans are ways in which EYHO helps to sustain the world's marginalized art artisanal societies. So Sheila, welcome to you, and I turn it over to you to uh, introduce the first presenter. Thank you so much, Kelsey. This is, and thank you everybody for joining us today to celebrate these young Indian textile revivalists. I'm amazed. I began going down this path uh, during the pandemic, actually, as I was putting on events on our uh, platform, and I was amazed by their passion and commitment to rejuvenating lost textile heritage. So please welcome our first panelist, uh, Shweta Mukherjee, who is based in Delhi. Shweta is a textile revivalist and collector. She promotes slow and sensible fashion. She works with small clusters of weavers to revive and recreate weaves that are in danger of dying out. Presently, she's working with muslins, trying to recreate indigenous yarns and fabric and blend the yarns with uh, animal fibers such as pashmina uh, on old traditional pit looms. In historical terms, muslin of undivided Bengal was the gold of textiles. It brought traders from the West to Bengal through the quality of original, though the correct quality of original muslin cannot be reproduced, Shweta is trying to get closer to the texture and fineness of the indigenous yarns. So Shweta, you want to come on? Um, Hello everyone, I hope you can hear me. 
So I think uh, maybe the best is for everybody to put on a speaker view, maybe, or I don't know. But anyway, Shweta, I can't see your you as an image. I can I don't see your are you on it? I wonder. I am there. I yeah. Like, okay, there you are. Okay, good. And we'll get started. So Shweta. Tell us about muslin, which is the golden textile of Bengal, also the gold of Bengal, really. Um, so get, get started. Uh, a very uh, warm welcome, everybody. I'm Shweta Mukherjee. Sheila, happy birthday. And uh, so uh, let's begin. Uh, so I'm here to talk about muslin, of, uh, undivided or united Bengal, which is as well as it was golden textile of Bengal. So let's begin. Sheila, next slide, please. Yeah. So over here, we are uh, trying to discuss in my presentation and this is about origin, history, fall of our indigenous Muslim revival, and our role, how we are contributing to it. And for you people who are map, not, uh, yeah, so the, the map, yeah, carry on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So in this map, you can see uh, it is United Bengal, which has, uh, which used to be. Uh, Bangladesh, which is now, and our present West Bengal. So this is a united province of Bengal. Can we go to the next slide, please? So let's talk about origin of muslin. So cotton textiles of Bengal province, which used to be known as Bengala, were exported to different parts of the world even 2,000 years ago. But then it was not known as muslin. But other names like uh, there are various other names. If you go back to history, which is in the next slide, so the Greek used to call this kind of cotton textile as Gangetica, so which was the word derived from the river Ganga, which where the Muslim uh, textiles used to be woven as well as traded from uh, port of Bengal. And then in the further in uh, further down, it was uh, it was mentioned in second century. Then the travelers uh, like Suleiman, Ibn Battuta, Mahum, and all these travelers have mentioned about cotton, very fine cotton textiles of Bengal. In 18th century, when the two European travelers, one of them, Thomas Boring, he could match the kind of uh, fabric which was, which, was, which was traded in Mosul, which is present in Iraq, and the same fabric which were woven in uh, Bengal, United Bengal, somehow he could connect and he gave the name Muslim, but before that, it was known by various other names. So, um, Shwata, just, uh, just something here. So, Muslim actually comes from, from Mosul, the town in Iraq, right? That right, Sheila. It was, it was mostly traded in, so that's where the Muslim word comes yeah. from, but it was not known as Muslim in, within India no. or Bangladesh. Okay. For example, during the reign of Jahangir, uh, there were several names given to Muslim, like uh, Abravan, which is flowing water, or Shabna, which is morning dew, due to the texture of the Muslim. But it was never called Muslim. Muslim came mostly with the trading of Europeans, not before that. Right. And beautiful poetic names as well. You have woven air, the morning dew, you know, for, for right. this texture. Shabna. Most beloved. Shabna means the dew, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So let's let's go into why it uh, it fell, like why it almost disappeared. So let's talk about the muslin as a fabric. It was dark enough, it was sheer, it was very delicate textile, which uh, used to come, it used to spun as well as it used to be woven by very nimble hands, very dexterous hands of weavers. And the cotton crop was to be short staple. And it was grown, the cotton crop used to be grown, I mean, they used to grow in a particular area, which is nearby Dhaka, present day Dhaka. The reason being, it required a certain kind of salinity of, in the soil, a certain kind of rainfall and climatic condition, as well as the rivers nearby. So that's the reason uh, the, the muslin was produced, that, that kind of fine muslin, which even hardly could have felt by hand, that sort of was only produced in Bengal, as well as the spinners and the weavers of such textile. But uh, this short, short staple was not suitable for uh, mills. So when with industrial revolution, 
So first there was uh, import uh, duty uh, duty or taxes imposition by European traders. Recently, sorry, the local... Shweta, sorry to interrupt. Yes. I'm, I'm getting a lot of people on chat saying that they can't hear very well. This feedback noise, almost like wind. Can you just maybe move your uh, speaker a little closer or if you have ear earphones, maybe you have you do have earphones on. So is, is it just transmission? Yeah, there's we've got turn off all audio except speaker. So Darlene says, can you please all mute yourselves uh, and everybody turn it on? I, I can also turn myself off so that there's nobody else talking except Shweta. Would that work? Let's try that, everybody. Can we mute ourselves completely, all of us, and only Sweta talk? Yeah. All of our attendees are muted. I think, uh, Sweta, is your is your microphone in your earpiece or in your computer? Where is your audio coming in from? Uh, is it okay at the moment? Mm, no, uh, is it audible? That That's better right there. Yeah. Okay. Maybe, so maybe let's slow start. down. Slow down the delivery as well a little bit. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. All right. Okay. Let's get. Let's move on. All right. So sorry. Oh. Uh, just a sec. I'll go back to the slide. Yeah. Carry on. So yeah. yeah still talking about the. So I was. I was talking about the muslin and uh, the finest of muslin, uh, which hardly could have. Uh, we could have touched them. So similarly, uh, the, the fall actually began with the high import duties by French government and then uh, British government. And all these had happened because the Muslim was Muslim and a particular type of Muslim was Asa. It was competing with their own production of woolen cloths and linen. So there were high import duties. And secondly, post to industrial revolution, British wanted to uh, you know, generate or produce muslin with uh, mills, with Lancashire or Manchester mills. And the yarns uh, for that, for those mills, the cotton uh, yarns, were not suitable of that of Bengal. So they wanted to discourage the indigenous or desi crops, particularly two varieties which used to produce finest of muslin, which is Koti and Boirati, mm -hmm. which uh, they, were, they were cultivated in Dhaka, present day Dhaka. So that okay. is the reason uh, the fall started. And by uh, by mid by mid twentieth centuries, Bengal used to be the uh, exporter of uh, fine muslins, fine cotton textiles. But by mid century, but by mid twentieth centuries, we were the consumer of Britain uh, cloths, Britain yarns as well as cloths. So uh, that's how that's that's the story of fall. Mm -hmm. Okay. So one more sorry note about uh, make sure the Microsoft microphone isn't rubbing against your scarf. Uh, Sweta, uh, is it okay? Yeah, okay, let's go on. Right. Uh, so indigenous and your role now with the revival of indigenous muslin, which is, right. as you can see here, it's also used for draperies and ever so fine, carry on. Right. Mm -hmm. So if you see the uh, photograph or the image over there, you see how uh, sheer fabric uh, that we have made, it is not as fine as, uh, you know, the, the previous cotton because we don't have the crop. But with uh, even hybrid cotton, we are making such fine cottons uh, and Jambani work on it. So for example, this, this is a two meter floor and uh, width is about one meter and, uh, and this textile is about uh, 40, 40 grams, 42 grams. So this is the weight that we have come. However, uh, for example, the finest of muslin, which is malvas cast, which used to be there, which used to be a plain kind of uh, plain texture cotton, then it was 18 meters of length and one meter of width. Such kind of cloth used to uh, weigh about two, 255 to 240 grams. So it's... Uh, yeah, it's, it's amazing, a, isn't it? Yeah. Amazing. I mean, uh, right. but still we can go nearby, but uh, it will take us, uh, it will take time. It will take a lot of patience to go back to, to visit our history. So there were three kinds of muslin, which was, as Sheila said, plain, patterned, and flowered. Now, in case of pattern, pattern used to be uh, with hand embroidery, and the pattern, again, uh, the second pattern was from uh, loom embroidered fabrics. So the loom embroidered pattern fabric is what we have jamdani, and then also it was uh, jamdani. And in pattern, we used to have chicken embroidery, which actually originated from Dhaka, and uh, uh, you know, it was uh, it was Noor Jahan uh, who uh, who 
who tried chicken on muslin first as mm-hmm. well as uh, silver threads like kashida badla these right. uh, these works and still we practice such works and in our revival story you can uh, we are we're trying to make uh, these embroideries on such fine muslin okay so let's go into your role you you as you said you're working so on we are the focusing old on right so we are mm-hmm. focusing on uh, creating finer hand spun yarns what is happening with technology with machinery you know with uh, uh, with uh, fast fashion the the sustainable hand spun or the uh, hand spun yarns are getting uh, you know deteriorated day by day the quality as well as the demand so we are trying to focus on that we are trying we are trying to get different kinds of cotton and see how elast uh, see or check their elasticity their fragileness and we are trying to get fine because if we have fine yarns we can weave fine muslin we can give fine texture right. second we are reviving very uh, the plain muslins which is almost uh, there is uh, start, it's not it? there yeah. yeah so few pieces in uh, museums few pieces with the uh, jagat safe and other mm-hmm. uh, uh, the traders or then so we right. have so we are trying to revive the plain muslins plain fine muslins as well as patterned muslins secondly uh, thirdly we are bringing the old designs like the patterns uh, that used to be during yester years the the jamdani because with age we are what we are trying the jamda what we see in jamdani that the the patterns are getting minimized mm-hmm. and then using fine muslins as various like garments uh, blending muslin with animal fibers otherwise uh, which other is what fibers. we have here right here you have the pashmina right. with the muslin yeah mm-hmm. so this is uh, this is something which we have tried for the first time and i don't think anybody is producing such kind of fabric because ours is also at a phase uh, in a sampling stage you can see in the warp it is muslin fine muslin hand spun muslin and in the weft hand spun fleece or a fleece of changthangi goats changra goats which is pashmina mm. or lena in their local language what a so for example yeah thank you so for this uh, this fine uh, warm fleece as well as muslin which is about 260 grams for 2 meter and 1 meter of width i think this is a very very fine texture that we are get, uh, trying to give and we are also working on it to make it more finer now you see what you see is a jrug which is again a uh, resist as well as block dyed uh, uh, block printing so uh, here the the indigo is natural as well as the green part that you see that is mixed with indigo and pomegranate peel so it's a very it's, it's a very old design and it takes 12 uh, various steps to to get into this it's amazing and now you got the beautiful kantha yes uh, so katha is basically a quilt or a quilt of bengal now katha katha is commercialized now but it was always a folk art it was done by women of uh, bengal during their leisure time so this is what you see is a quilt made of three layers of muslin and then uh, the the pattern that you see it's a pomegranate from tree of life so uh, the the kalamkari and the tree of life those patterns we are trying to give this in uh, we are trying to keep uh, place this on muslin and we are trying to make beautiful texture out of it and this is so can... soft i i own a couple of kanta pieces i cannot get over how soft and fine the muslin is when you when you you know stitch it together like this uh this is chicken this is chicken work so this is tape cheap particular uh, stitch is called tape cheap running uh, uh, chicken running work this is again uh, done on sorry this is again done on a very fine muslin and uh, there are other products other chicken embroidery where we are trying to uh, go close as to bengal quilts we might not have those uh, embroiders but we are trying to revive what we had during uh, six, uh, 17th or 18th century and then you're into muslin bags as well which is another project yeah and then this is your uh, jamdani so those bags we Yeah. because mm-hmm. muslin is so airy muslin is so porous that uh, if you keep your uh, keep your silk uh, fabrics or as well as woolen fabrics uh, they are kind of you know they are kind of protector so it, it's just like it works like air bags i say cloth bags so that's okay. why we're making uh, right. fine muslins yeah we'll, we'll wrap uh, up this is again uh, mm-hmm. this Carry is on. jamdani this is jamdani from uh, from dhaka 
You can see again the old Techi pattern which we are uh, which we are placing on muslin. And this is loom embroidered jamdani. And the, the looms of Dhaka surprisingly have not changed. Nothing changed. I mean, uh, as it was in early, uh, in early 18th century or 19th century, it is still uh, still like still that. Still the same. So That's amazing. Still the same. Yeah. Well, Shweta, sadly, we have to wrap up. But uh, fascinating. There's been a few questions coming in. And uh, Kelsey, sure. do, we, do we go to the questions at the end? I think we'll go to the questions right at the end. So everybody... Please uh, stick around. Uh, Shweta, thank you so much for that very informative. And I just, I wanna say that muslin is, is, a, is a lifelong love affair. If it, it's you get in your hands on muslin, as you know, in history, everybody has been- So this is what is muslin it. is. This is what mm -hmm. is muslin is. And if you wear this fabric, I'm sure you cannot wear any other cotton fabric. This is, yeah. this is so soft. Are you wearing something? Yeah, of course you're wearing something. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much. Thanks so much. Everybody. Thank you so much. Um, Thank and you. Thanks stick for the around. I'm going to, the next panelist is coming up. Um, I'm going to share that. Uh, Bapa Ditya, are you Hello. around? Hi, Bapa. Yes, uh, Hello. Hello, everybody. Hello. Hi. So Bapa Ditya uh, has been uh, traveling and he has just come back from uh, Spain where he was um, he was showing his patterns and uh, let me just escape that see that and get shared that um, okay so here we go can everybody see Zen the zone of my resilience yes great, looks yes. good okay so let me just go into a little intro on Baba. So Baba Ditya Biswas from Calcutta is one of India's foremost textile experts and has been redefining Bengal handloom and giving the textiles a new look and feel. He created the brand Bailu, B-A-I-L-O-U, as well as the iconic Bailu store in Calcutta. One of his weaves has actually won the UNESCO seal of excellence. For Baba, the slow disappearance of hand-painted textiles or chins was a gauntlet thrown down. He used lockdown, slow time to teach himself traditional techniques of hand-painted textiles. Bapa was concerned about correcting the commonly held perception that chintz is produced digitally. A revival was timely and necessary. So Bapa, we're going to take, let you take it away. I'm going to play the, go ahead Bapa. Yeah, so uh, my my background is actually I come uh, from a tea, tea garden. We could go to the next slide, I think, uh, mm -hmm. Sheila. Okay. So um, I come from a tea garden based uh, background where I had no connection in, with textiles. Neither I've studied art or tech, uh, but uh, after my uh, high school, I started to figure out what I really wanted to do. And I figured that textiles uh, was something which I was hugely attracted to. So I kind of took up textiles much later in my life, studied textiles from this organization called NIFT in Calcutta. And hence my journey with the handloom started. So uh, I basically started working with the handlooms because way back in uh, uh, around the turn of the, um, I mean, millennium, the Bengal handlooms was going through a huge slump and there was hardly any work for the weavers and I saw actually how the looms were being dismantled and being sold off as firewood. So that really moved me a lot and uh, I uh, thought that if I have studied textile design and if my dis I mean knowledge I can put into some use and work with the community to build up uh, alternative markets for the skill that they have, which has been passed down from the generation uh, so that they can earn their, uh, I mean, livelihood. So with that thing in mind, we, I started working uh, with the community of weavers over there where, I st where we started doing experiments with textures and we formed a new genre of, uh, uh, genre of textile, which is now called Bailu, which is actually our brand. But our experiments were so um, unique in itself that people started calling our textiles as uh, Bailu textiles. So it's now in India, if, if you, if you uh, know that 
I mean, they re refer to our te te textiles as bailu. So this, I was working for the last 20 years and then suddenly the pandemic happened. And uh, as we all know that rural India was very badly hit. Uh, there was no work, things stopped totally. And I was watching all my weavers, I mean, all their work coming to a halt. But we kind of supported them in a way. We placed orders in advance so that our weavers would have worked throughout the pandemic and uh, would run their looms. But what I started doing is I started uh, Bengal. Um, I mean, really had a rich history of indigo, but uh, it it was also a very sad history where the oppression of by the uh, I mean, British indigo cultivators was went to such heights that. Uh, the farmers they stopped uh, planting indigo because there was a huge bengal famine which happened because they were forced to plant indigo and not uh, a seed of rice so they had no food and the man made famine happened in bengal i'm talking about almost 200 years back and the that the impact of that was so deep into minds of the people uh, that uh, bengal stopped sowing indigo after that and so after almost 165 years uh, I thought, well, Bengal, I think should, we were all sitting down, my weavers had no work, most of them, but they had uh, agricultural land. So I thought, why not plant some indigo and try to extract some indigo dyes out of it. And we did it successfully. And we extracted our own pigment. As you can see, we plowed the field. It was a huge taboo, which we had to overcome. And, but we still did, and we extracted our own, own indigo. That is amazing. Look at all that indigo. What riches. Absolutely wonderful. Um, okay, so yeah, let's get into the history of chintz, which is a bit of a misnomer, isn't it? Yeah, so as you all know, I won't read it. Everybody can read on the screen. We know what, what chintz is. And uh, what. so what I did, did during the pandemic is I started training myself how to paint chintz because here I was working with natural dyes. We had planted our indigo and extracted the pigment. We have worked with madder and turmeric and uh, marigolds. Uh, but I always felt that the original way how they would print, I mean, paint chins uh, was not practiced much in India. Now, Kalamkari is a, uh, like a watered down version, I would say, of the original style of printing, but they still hold on to the basic techniques. But uh, the kind of color shades, the the uh, detailedness of the patterns is not practiced anymore. What we see chins now in the market is all, di all, all digitally printed and which I think kills the craft uh, because it's so easy to print. I mean, exactly what the Manchester mills did to the Indian muslins or the printed uh, painted chins was exactly what digital prints is doing to our crafts nowadays. So, here is the is the like a comparison between the kalam curry. The processes are quite the same. The ingredients are quite the same, but it is in the detailed workmanship and some few uh, technical uh, way how we create the moderns, which differ from the which makes chins differ different from the kalam curry that we still get to see in the market. So Bapa Kalam Kari, uh, just for the people who don't speak Hindi, it's uh, Kalam is a pen, which is you see like a bamboo pen there, which has the natural dye in there. And Kari is the art, right? Am I correct? Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, so absolutely. Kalam Kari, right. OK. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So here is your timeline. Yeah, so here's the timeline. Like if we see the timeline, then how it originated. And by 2019, if we see that uh, I mean, the uh, revival of chins patterns has come back to the market because people love the ornate, embellished uh, look uh, of the chins. But because there are no, no not many practitioners anymore, the uh, the chins original chins patterns are now digitally being, I mean, reproduced onto cloth or screen printed onto cloth and being sold as chins. So right. chins has become like a kind of a, de a design now rather than a technique. So this is how so, you went back, yeah, carry This on. is how I went back to, yeah, I was in Canada in Vancouver uh, years back and I got the opportunity to do, attend a workshop by Michelle Garcia, who is an excellent master in natural dyes. And I took a class 
where a three day class where he taught us how to paint with 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 natural dyes and that really opened my eyes into this world of chins and uh, so in the, during the pandemic when i had no work i started taking out my old notes i call, i emailed michel that i really want to start back and because i've forgotten a lot of things that we are, he had taught and i was in communication with him over the emails and then i started to set up my studio i i i made a table layered it with jute cloth and then cotton cloth made a table i had my reference books i had uh, all the organic salts uh, that i would turn into moderns and i started my experiments various experiments so here is the dyes we use uh, you can see the marigold we use the three different marigolds of our three different shades of yellows olive to a bright yellow then we have the um, uh, the hibiscus flower which 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 gives us the beige uh, the madder root sticks which gives us uh, the reds and uh, um, we have others which uh, we have we use as uh, tannins uh, like the mm. myrobal and, and and the gall nuts we use the tannin and the indigo the, the, that you see is the indigo that we grow in in bengal at the moment so this is the bengal indigo that we grow and i yeah. paint 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 with that Lovely. so here you can see what the first thing what i did is because i had to get get a grip on the color because the color could be very tricky and so i start i did a color shade card uh using various moderns uh, and uh, adding a bit of iron to the moderns i tried to change the tint and the hue of the color so went from fresh color to like really dark and deep colors so first i played with the uh, color chart i created a color chart which gave me um, which made it very easy for me to kind of uh, it was like almost like a reference and then as you can see on the left hand side of the screen these were my initial uh, drawings and sketches and my way of trying to get used to the color so it took me like two years to kind of get a grip on actually the because natural dyes sometimes can be very tricky they behave they have their own mind and sometimes they would behave quite strangely yeah. so that's yeah, the beauty think, of natural dyes right yeah yes, so carry yes. on mm -hmm. so while i was uh, working with the natural dyes and doing my experiments i would put it up on my instagram page and my facebook page and uh, i had few friends from all over the world who would like give me a lot of advice so suddenly i met i meet this australian artist uh, on my facebook and she falls in love with the work the work that i do and she got fascinated with the whole story of how i started working in during the pandemic and she approached me saying that would i like to do a collaboration with her because at that moment the australian government was sponsoring a art collaboration with the artists uh, with the countries uh, all over uh, who are uh, united by the indian ocean so all the countries which share indian oceans was collaborating with an australian artist and they were trying to create various artworks so my collaboration with the artist was uh, all the mythological creatures of the indian ocean uh, and we started with that and we ended up into what we get now in in uh, is like plastic and chappals and uh, toothbrushes and plastic bottles so it was a very beautiful transition which we showed through the through the paintings oh, and uh, right. yeah so yeah okay carry on mm -hmm. and these were so slowly as i started working as you can see from my initial doodles to here which is becoming my hand was getting more and more uh stronger and uh, my grip was getting more and more stronger i was trying to be able to keep the dyes in a certain way the way where i wanted wasn't bleeding i was getting a, uh, i could replicate the depth and the richness of the colors every time i was dying so as i kept on working Amazing. it became better, better and better you could you can see the tran transition beautiful beautiful and look at this and now this is my oh current my work that i'm working so i think i've come closer to the original chins as you can see uh, so I, my inspiration is always from the old paintings that i that are only available now in a museum books and collectors so i bought this whole lot of books from the uh, i'm victoria albert museum and various books 
I refer to to uh, I mean carry on my work, but I also put in my own idea of the birds and the placements are different, and I I get inspired from various uh, uh, elements of chintz because chintz is a very complicated design uh, layout. So I simplify it at times. I take out some parts and I recreate and create my own chintz. Amazing, amazing. So thank you so much, Bapa. That was just amazing. You can find Bapa Ditya on Instagram, uh, Facebook. Instagram is under Bailu, right? Am I correct, Bapa? You didn't have your, do you have yeah, your yeah. details here? B-A-I underscore L-O-U, correct? Yeah. 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 He's on Insta. And uh, if anybody's interested in getting in touch, please contact Kelsey and Kelsey will contact me and we will put you in touch with Bapa Ditya, who's truly, uh, one of India's uh, tr treasures, you know, to, in, in how he's reviving Kalmkaris. Thank you so much, Bapa, for Thank joining you. us Thank today. Thank you very much. Okay, then. Bye-bye. All right. So um, I hope you're, you've all, uh, you're all waiting for the final panelist now, who is uh, Shashi of... Um, of Yatri Weaves, and I'm going to see if I can call up her presentation to share here uh, and see now. Okay, here we go. So please welcome uh, Shashi. She also know, goes by the name uh, Gayatri. Gayatri is her, her, um, her, her real name. Oops. Um, can everybody see the screen right now? Yes. yes? Okay, so I'm going to tell you a little bit more, a little bit about uh, Gayatri or Shashi. Shashi she prefers to go by the name Shashi of Yatri means, Yatri means journey, and it has been a, a lifelong journey or almost a lifelong journey for this young revivalist. She's an independent textile researcher with a full-time job uh, in a corporate office in Chennai, in India. Chennai is also the new name for Madras, and she's currently working with two weaving families and two artisans who help her recreate forgotten textiles of Tamil Nadu. So let's just go into, just get back into my Zoom here. Okay, so let's start the presentation. Okay, so Shashi. Okay. Hello everyone, thank you so much, Sheila. Uh, so I'm Shashi and I'm from Chennai, India. So. My interest in textile started, uh, you know, when I was a part-time reseller, uh, when I was working. So I couldn't distinguish a handloom fabric from a powerloom fabric then. So I started, uh, you know, learning about how to distinguish a fabric. And from there, it started about, uh, you know, textiles of India. So when I started with textiles of India, I came to understand that, you know, we have a lot of weaves and, uh, uh, you know, it, it, it there is too much. So... Uh, to start with, I wanted to focus on the place that I was born. So I thought, you know, why not focus on, you know, textiles of Tamil Nadu? So, so that is something that I want to talk today. Uh, Sheila, can you go to the next one, please? Yeah. Yes, mm -hmm. thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, so today I want to talk about, you know, the types of textiles that were earlier there in Tamil Nadu and the ones that are already on the verge of, uh, you know, uh, disappearing now and the revivals that uh, we have done till now and my role and aspirations in it. Yep. Uh, so when it comes to textiles of Tamil Nadu, I have tried to categorize these into three things. So one being the hand-painted textiles, the second being the hand-woven textiles, and the third being handcrafted, where I have, you know, uh, put it as embroidery and lace, lace making. So hand-painted textiles, like what Baba was saying, the entire coast of, you know, the Coromandel uh, part was, uh, was uh, doing hand-painted uh, textiles. And when it comes to Tamil Nadu, while the Britishers were taking survey, there were artists in, you know, Kumbakonam, Negapatnam, Sikanai, Kapit, and Tanjavur. These are the states, you know, districts in Tamil Nadu that were actually very famous for their painting skills. And most of these fabrics, the painted fabrics were exported for the Indonesian market then. Uh, so of these all districts, only Tanjavur uh, painting is existing. And uh, the Sikanai Kapit district uh, still works on the hand-painted uh, fabrics. And when it comes to hand-woven textiles, I've tried to broadly classify into sarees, dothis, fabrics. So fabrics can be checked and also plain, and bed sheets and carpets. So not a lot of people know carpets are actually were, uh, woven in uh, Kumbakonam and Iampet, and there are records of Britishers who 
completely admired them so they they were literally you know fighting over each other saying like who's going to keep what so when it comes to embroidery oh, uh, zardozi zardozi and beetle wings from madras were quite famous and lace making came from the portuguese people to the trunalveli district and right now few people from kanyakumari are working with lace making so yes that's about the textiles of tamil nadu and here i've tried to you know simply portray of what on all is having here so the first image is actually a bed sheet or a carpet weaving that is happening in erode so uh, the original weaving this is actually a pit loom and you can see uh, uh, two people working on it and at times there will be 12 pedals so when the uh, weaver is actually operating the loom it will be literally like he's dancing on the loom so mm-hmm. an a normal a normal uh, weaver uses mostly two to three pedals but imagine using 12 pedals right now in in the present time we have like two or three people who uses six pedals at the most but history says there are almost people who operated 12 pedals so that okay. is the first image and the second image is you know uh, from kanjivaram uh, this is actually the pallav of the sari which uh, shows elephant and the below part which shows the flower okay. from the second row you can see war picket that was done in madras and the second row second image states about another uh, beautiful kanjivaram weave which has both thread work and also zari work the third image is of madras checks and the fourth image is the sikanai kampet painting so when it comes to sikanai kampet painting it started with designing uh, you know temple chariots so from then on when uh, martin singh you know uh, came to know about this art he totally fell in love with it and then he wanted samples uh, fra- of this art and he took a few of uh, stoles and uh, you know sarees uh, made from these artists and he put it out in an exhibition in london and those were the first things to have you know to have been sold out so sikana ikambet is like you know the favorite favorite art of uh, martin singh and can we go to the next one please yes and here the first image is actually about mushroom so mushroom is a textile where uh, you know the top part of uh, the textile is actually silk satin weave and the bottom part of the textile is actually cotton so when the mohammedans ruled india uh, their uh, you know the religion prohibited them from wearing silk so in order to technically wear silk they invented a mechanism where the silk doesn't touch the part of the skin but still it will be like they'll be wearing uh, silk so the first uh, three images are of you know ikat and the tie and dye pattern whereas there is also patterned mushroom not a lot of people know that we also did patterned mushroom everybody thinks you know it's just you know ikat patterns or stripes or play but we also did patterned mushroom and to the top right you can see kodali karpu which is a tapestry weave uh, done using uh, you know uh, cotton and um, it was actually hand painted not a lot of people know that also everyone thinks it's actually block printed but it is hand painted and uh, you know uh, there's also tapestry weave and it is naturally dyed so there's so much history about kola likar but we can talk about it all day yeah and the last two images are about you know beetle wing embroidery which is beetle wing embroidery beautiful. thank you so much sheila so when it comes to beetle wing embroidery uh, we have records of uh, this embroidery dating back to 6th century bc and deccan region was actually creating these for the european market and madras was you know uh, one of the highest exporter by then so there were few women from uh, tandyar pet so currently the place is called as tandyar pet uh, who used to do beetle wings but right now there are nobody uh, doing it uh, so we have tried to you know uh, ethically source beetle wings and with the help of a kariger i'm trying to do certain projects uh, uh with a limited uh, number for the particular time of the year i think you're one of the few beetle wing revivalists because the the this image that you see on the top right hand bottom of your screen is mm-hmm. the the dress that was for one of the governesses i think that is right now in a museum in japan but not yes. many people have been uh, successful with beetle wing uh, revival can we go to the mm-hmm. next slide shashi yes please okay so your revival mm-hmm. so my revival so when i started with i wanted to work with uh, a family first i started i want to started with one family of weavers so i started with my hometown and then you know i persuaded them i i gave them museum samples and uh, and i told them like see your national award mm-hmm. winner and uh, you know your family has uh, so much history because by the time when british were documenting i am pete had only like uh, 15 or 16 weavers and from then on 
your family is still uh, you know working on uh, mushroom so the local name for mushroom here is actually putni so i persuaded them and then i i told them like okay let's not start with mushroom why don't you do a normal sell we'll start with war ticket Uh, so we started with war picket and then we went to work on you know satin border saris and uh, and currently we are working on few projects we'll probably keep you posted once uh, you know they are off the loom and mm-hmm. i'm also working on a desi cotton revival from tamil nadu so there's already a young uh, uh, you know revivalist who already uh, uh, you know uh, revived the cotton and uh, he spun yarns out of it but we are trying to you know make something useful out of it probably bring a revival version of the madras wow. checks and uh, beetle wing embroidery and hand painted silk and icon bed fabric I, so that I is what i have a question do you yes, ever sleep uh, shashi because you know you have a full time <laughs> it job and then you're also reviving all this so I amazing <laughs> <laughs> amazing let's go to the your revival so, your actual revival so, here mm-hmm. yeah so this was my first project that started in the pandemic so i gave them uh, initially the image but they weren't able to comprehend uh, what design was there in the pallu of the sari so we again had to go back to the museum archives and then get in the original details and then i told them you know uh, let's do it in the old method so the old method which doesn't use the jacquard machine so everything uh, that you see in the right side of the image here is done using hand with no machines and work so you can see warp picker and you can also see uh, patterns in the border of the sari and patterns on the pallu of the sari with the whole uh, you know body uh, having something what we call as muthukattam muthukattam means pearl checks so that is what we call so this, so this was my first project and my second project i chose uh, you know a satin weave so the image you see in the top right is actually a silk based weave so i took the motif of it and then i told why not try this in uh, a satin weave so that is what we tried so in the first and the second image you can probably see the fir- front side which has you know the red uh, silk base and the back side which is a green silk one and the satin border with the sheen and in the second uh, you know bottom uh, image you can see a uh, uh, gandabarunda which is actually a two head uh, word and also a mythological creature called yari so that we have tried to incorporate it in the pallu of the sari and if you see the second image in the sari we have also tried to incorporate the signature of the weaver so wow. it's not just me right so there are also people involved there is a master weaver involved so i wanted to put in this put his name also over there so we created a script which is uh, usually found in the temples so and we create uh, we translated it uh, we translated their names using the script and we wove it in the pallu of the sari so that is what you see here and the pink one is actually my favorite so it's actually called a susi uh, pattern so susi is a pattern that was used for making trousers uh, for the english people uh so instead of making a whole fabric we thought why not you know try it on the border of the sari and what you see here is the, actually the result of it mm-hmm. beautiful beautiful let's go to the and mushroom and, yes and this is the actual mushroom so for the top one we have used a mulberry silk and for the bottom cotton weave we have used a 100 count hand spun cotton Oh so this goodness. is the actual mushroom, and with the help of a curryer, I tried to recreate a pattern uh, of the museum uh, tent of the Mughal period in the pallu of the sari here. So we have mm-hmm. created two flower, I mean, uh, two rows of flowers in the pallu of the sari, and uh, the satin weave on the front and on the reverse side, you can see, uh, you know, the cotton. Lovely, lovely. Okay, here we come to the beetle wing. Um, <laughs> yes. There's a question about the beetle wing, so maybe you just want to get into how you. uh where you get these and you know how you harvest them very quickly so uh we source uh, uh you know these uh, from mostly from thailand these are ethically sourced and uh, uh, i do all the cutting and the uh, you know putting uh, drilling the holes part here so mm-hmm. and then i i sit with the curryer i give the give her the design and then we uh, take time and then uh, you know go on with our project so that's how we do so i i i don't do uh, it commercially i probably do more uh, around uh, five or six projects a year depending upon the number of beetle wings used because i don't want this to be commercialized or uh, you know uh, some other people exploiting uh, the beetle wings as well so okay. i do very limited number of beetle wings here the middle image you see is actually my first project uh, i call it tree of life so that there were about 150 to 200 wings that we have used for this uh, particular uh, sari uh, but the ones on the blue is actually a stole uh, so we wanted to use less of beetle wings and more of the embroidery and we tried to you know match it mm-hmm. uh, but uh, the base didn't come out well but i was happy with the result of the embroidery so we thought we'll try this design probably in some other uh, fabric 
Beautiful. So this is about okay. beetle wing embroidery, and this is the Sikhan but art that I was talking about. This is so the actual hand painted. Hand yes. Painted, right? yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. So most of the Sikhan Aikampet uh, designs that you see in the market right now are actually screen printed or, uh, you know, um, they are already printed and then uh, the colors put upon on. But the ones that we do are entirely hand painted right from scratch and we try to create something new every time. So for instance, if you see the far right of the image, you can see, uh, you know, some distorted images in the ceiling of, uh, you know, a cave. So that is actually the fourth image uh, you, you can see here. So it's from uh, Jane Cave. Uh, the painting is almost 3000 years old. So, and uh, we wow. tried to recreate it. So this is actually a scene where, uh, you know, two Buddhist monks are trying to uh, gather a thousand petal lotus, uh, which, which you can offer to their, uh, uh, you know, guru for, uh, to get lectures from. So to help these Buddhists, you have uh, a shape-shifting creature called Makara to guide them. And you also have elephants, uh, you know, who's uh, trying to help them to identify the thousand petal lotus. And you can also see some ducks who are, uh, uh, you know, uh, kind of afraid of uh, seeing all the uh, uh, people who are coming in and then who's trying to disturb the ecosystem here. So oh, this wonderful. is something that captured my heart yeah. and I, this is like a project that is very close to my heart. This Love. is something that we did recently. Uh, but the other three images you see are something that we did it last year. So the creature at the bottom left you see is actually called Navakunjara. It's a combination of nine animals. So you can see hand and the head of a rooster and the neck of a peacock and, uh, you know, the leg of an elephant and the ox one and, uh, uh, you know, uh, the goat, the tiger, the horse, and there's also a snake. So uh, so it, it has a really long, uh, long story. And uh, uh, you can see a lot of uh, these uh, thing in Odisha. Uh, so so that is about us, uh, I compared. So my aspiration, you know, is to recreate all uh, the textiles from the museum archives and try to document them and let everyone know that, you know, the textiles of Tamil Nadu is not limited just to Kanjivaram. Mm -hmm. There's a lot mm -hmm. more. All right. Well, that was very enlightening, uh, Shashi. Thank you so much. And you can find, again, you can find Shashi on Instagram, on Facebook, under Yatri. And we've just had a, a whirlwind presentation of some of the textiles that are being lost in uh, Tamil Nadu and these very talented young people working so hard, holding down jobs and uh, you know, they're the sandwich generation as well between parents and all their other uh, responsibilities. And they're also reviving these textiles. So well, fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank you Thank very you so much. much. Okay, I'm going to stop sharing now. Thank you, Sheila. And thank you to the presenters. This was absolutely wonderful. Um, Sheila, we have just one minute before our next. Um, yeah. We're... And so I'm afraid we've run out of time for, for questions, questions unless there's Mm -hmm. Unless there's just one, you know, one great question that um, that you think we need to answer before we overarching question, yeah. So I think there was one question that that might kind of just uh, encapsulate uh, the, the the muslin, the chintz, and the kalamkari. They became known in the in the West through slightly derogatory, like chintz is a little kind of okay, it's cheap, or muslin can be cheap. Uh, so how how did this happen? Uh, so that was that was one of the questions I think. And um, so I, I can just weigh in here in, in interest of time. It happened because the what was the original artisanship in India got flooded with the industrial revolution in the West in Britain particularly. It, they they brought back a lot of the things you see when they when they took the took all these textiles back to Britain to sell, everybody was such huge demand. And then the industrial revolution happened where the spinning jenny came on and they were digitizing these. And then they had so many of these uh, textiles that were actually made in Britain that they brought these back into India and they were selling them to the local population because obviously India, huge market. And so, and then of course, also selling those to, to other countries in the West. So that's how now you have your, um, you have a slightly kind of this understanding or this misunderstanding, I should say, about muslin and chintz being, you know, kind of the cheaper version of these textiles, but we're trying to bring them 
uh, back into you know the, the original how it was done originally so if you have other questions please forward them to kelsey and then we will i she will cascade them down to me and i will get back to the uh, artisans thank you so much for joining us thank, thank you, you sheila thank you sheila and thank you all um that was absolutely wonderful